Well, please turn in your Bibles to our scripture reading, which is taken this morning from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. <clears throat> Again, our scripture reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. And then our sermon passage this morning is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. 2 Samuel 6, verses 1 to 11. But first, Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 29. And brothers and sisters, this is the holy and living word of the Lord. For you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest in the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to, an, to innumer, innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of all things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Now turning, if you will, to 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse 1 and reading through verse 11. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned to the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Now, come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. This ends the reading of God's most holy word. Let's pray. Our gracious God, just as you are, so is your word. You are holy. And your word is holy. And we pray, dear Lord, that we would hear your word. That we would receive it as your very word. As you speaking to us. We pray, dear Lord, that we would give it the authority that is due. We pray, dear Lord, that you, by your word, would continue that great work of transforming us, of sanctifying us, of shaping us into the image and the likeness of your beloved Son. Lord, please guide us for what we have heard, perhaps to some is difficult and challenging. Please guide us and help us to understand. 
May you be exalted, O Lord, now through the preaching and the hearing of your preached word. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Now, in last week's sermon passage, we read of how the Philistines had brought their idols into battle. And those idols were subsequently left behind when David and his men defeated them the first time. And that, of course, was reminiscent of how the Israelites, before they had a king, had taken the Ark of the Covenant into battle against the Philistines. You remember back in the early chapters of 1 Samuel. And the Israelites were defeated, and they lost the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines. And though the Ark only remained in the possession of the Philistines for a period of seven months, the Philistines could not wait to get rid of it because of all of the havoc that God was making in every Philistine city to which the Ark was taken. And the ark eventually arrived at the house of Abinadab in Kiriath Jerim, which was about nine miles west, northwest of Jerusalem, and there it remained for 20 years, as 1 Samuel 7 2 says. But now the time had come for the ark of the covenant to come out from the caretaking of Abinadab's household and be brought to the new capital city, the city of David, Jerusalem. Now, the ark was not a visual representation of God. In other words, it didn't give a picture of what God looked like. But it was a vivid symbol of his immediate presence with his people. It symbolized the fact, the truth, the reality that God was immediately there with them. And so it made perfect sense to bring the ark of the covenant to the seat of power at Israel to constantly remind people that it was God who was the true king. The ark was a symbol of God's kingship. Verse 2, and speaking of the ark, says that it is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim. David refers to the ark in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 2, as God's footstool, which implies that his throne is in heaven and his feet rest upon the ark here on earth. The ark was coming to Jerusalem, and the account of the incident with Uzzah, in the words of R.C. Sproul in his book, The Holiness of God, spurs protests from readers who have been taught that God is a God of love and kindness. And perhaps in your own minds, as we read this passage this morning, perhaps if you read it over the last couple of days, you read it and you thought, how could God do such a thing to this man? Well, that's one of the things that we'll consider this morning as we work our way through this passage. And as we work our way through, I'd ask you to, to, to keep this thought uh, before you. Our God, infinite in holiness and infinitely different from us, became one of us so that we could be made holy like him. Let me say that again. Our God, infinite in holiness and infinitely different from us became one of us so we could be made holy like him. Well, to some of your great relief, this is just a two-point sermon. That doesn't necessarily mean it's any shorter, but it only has two points this this morning. The first point of the sermon is national holiday, and the second point of the sermon is without reverence and awe. Again, point number one, national holiday, and point two, without reverence and awe. So let's look at the first part of the sermon, national holiday. Verses one and two say that David gathered 30,000 of his chosen men of Israel, and they went up from Baal, Judah, which was another name for Kiriath-Jerim, to bring the ark of God to Jerusalem. Now, this seems like a, a huge number of people to do what in reality, only took a few people to do, especially considering the, the mode of conveyance that they cho- chose to use for the ark. But remember that Kiriath Jerem was on the border of, uh, of, of Judah with the Canaanite lands to the west. And so it was important for them to have a large armed presence. But also, this was a day of celebration, it was a joyous occasion. And so, a, a large turnout of the people of Israel came to take part. Now, you're all familiar with the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And it's a, it's, a, it's a saying for a reason, because it's true in many cases. 
We've all experienced this in our lives. What is new or foreign to us is views, viewed as exotic and exciting. But after time and exposure, these things that are new and exciting, they become mundane and often boring to us. And how quickly have you purchased a, a new phone, the latest model? And it's so exciting at first. And then within, what, a couple of weeks, maybe a month, maybe two You've grown tired of it and are waiting for the next edition to be issued. This happens with new nifty things we buy. It happens with our jobs. It happens in marriages when the honeymoon phase wears off. And somehow, unexplained in our passage, it seems to have happened to Israel in her relationship with the Lord in the time leading up to the events of this passage. And the first indication that the ark of God is being treated in an overly familiar way is found in verse 3, where we read that the ark was being carried on a new cart. The physical symbol of God's presence with Israel was to be treated with great reverence, despite the festive atmosphere of the occasion. It was a physical sign of the spiritual presence of God with his people. And there were specific rules that governed how it was to be transported. According to Numbers chapter 4, a specific clan of the Levite tribe, the Kohathites, were responsible for the most holy things in the tabernacle. And the most holy of the most holy things was the ark of God. The sons of Aaron were responsible for preparing the most holy things for transport. They were to carefully cover all of the articles within the Holy of Holies with cloth, with fabric, with, with skins of animals. And they were to place the poles in the carrying rings on the ark. And there was another uh, carrying uh, device that they used, and that also had poles. And after everything was covered and ready, then and only then, the Kohathites went to work. The Kohathites were not even to look at the holy things and certainly could not touch them. Those were privileges reserved for the sons of Aaron alone. Numbers 4, chapter, 5, chapter 4, verse 15 says, And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary as the camp sets out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come and carry these. But they must, must not touch the holy things lest they die. And then just a few verses later in Numbers chapter 4, verse 20, God tells the Israelites that the Kohathites will die if they even look at the holy things. Numbers chapter 7 verse 9 also states clearly that the, that the Kohathites had to carry the ark of God on their shoulders. And so the poles that went through the rings at the corners of the ark, they were to be lifted up and put on the shoulders of the Kohathites. Now unfortunately, in arranging for a cart to transport the ark instead of the Kohathites carrying it on poles resting on their shoulders, David was following the example of the Philistines 20 years earlier when they returned the ark to Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7, the Philistine priests told the people, Now then, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke, and yoke the cows to the cart. The sad irony is that the Philistine people at least consulted with their priests about how to move the ark, but David, at least on his first attempt, did not. 1 Chronicles chapter 15 clearly shows that David knew the proper way, way that the ark should be carried. And in that chapter, on the second attempt to, to move the ark into Jerusalem, he does have the Levites there, the sons of Aaron, the Kohathites. He has them there, and they carry out their proper roles. But it seems like David just couldn't be bothered to do it right the first time. And this had catastrophic, catastrophic consequences. Two of Abinadab's sons were driving the new cart, as verses 3 and 4 say. Ahio walking in front of the cart and Uzzah at the rear. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals, as verse 5 says. And one commentator writes, David's parade was both a public statement and a genuine act of worship where Yahweh's presence in the ark was celebrated. This was a joyous occasion which, caused, which called for public worship. And David was right to bring the ark to the capital city of this new united kingdom of Israel and Judah. And that brings us now to the second part of the sermon, without reverence and awe. 
David had good intentions. He was right to want to worship and to celebrate this occasion. But the way that he carried out his plan was flawed. Verses 6 and 7 say, And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. Now what happened to Uzzah sounds barbaric to our postmodern ears, doesn't it? How could God have broken out against Uzzah, as David puts it in verse 8? for something as harmless as him placing his hand on the ark to stabilize it. But if it sounds barbaric to you and me, then we have to realize that we are making the same error in our thinking that David and Uzzah made in theirs. We're thinking of God as tame, as domesticated, as harmless, as being under our control and our protection. Our thinking is no different than David's and Uzzah's, and it's no different than the Philistines with their household gods, and no different than the Israelites back in the early chapters of 1 Samuel when they decided to take the ark into battle, to manipulate the Lord, to use him as a weapon against their enemies. Even the use of the cart itself was the result of carelessness on the part of David. Now, when you picture the, the cart used to transport the ark, don't think of a modern trailer with tandem axles. Don't think even of a four-wheeled prairie wagon with steerable front wheels. Picture instead a flat bedded cart with two large wheels on either side with a wooden tongue used to hitch the cart to the yokes on the oxen or the cattle that are pulling it. And if you can picture such a thing, perhaps you've, I don't know, seen a movie that has a cart like this in it, showing some sort of ancient time. But if you can picture this, then you can imagine that this kind of cart was inherently unstable, far less stable than a group of men carrying it on poles on their shoulders. But this was probably deemed the most expedient way of moving the ark from Kiriath Jerem to Jerusalem. The symbol of God's presence in Israel was to be handled with great care, first and foremost by not being handled at all. Abinadab's sons apparently had followed the required rules in getting the ark onto the cart because none of them had died in that process, but the Lord is not a God to be trifled with. We are commanded in Hebrews chapter 12 to worship him with reverence and awe because he is a consuming fire. And I've wondered if the human author of Hebrews had our passage this morning in his mind as he wrote those words. What was truly a joyful occasion for God's people was lacking in reverence and awe because of the, the absence of the ark from God's people for the past 20 years. Now, this seems counterintuitive because you would think that the absence of the ark from Israel for two decades would have made it seem new and exotic to the people. But I think the people had adopted the Canaanites household God attitude toward the Lord. They were lacking in a true and proper fear of God because they saw him as manipulable, as controllable, just like the household gods of the Canaanites. They didn't recognize the fact that the God of Israel is a holy God. He is set apart from them, totally different than them, completely spotless and pure, completely without sin or evil. And when we forget God's holiness, we begin to, to treat him with greater familiarity, with less respect, more like a buddy than an almighty God. To quote, quote Sproul once again, when the Bible calls God holy, it means primarily that God is transcend, transcendentally separate. He is so far above and beyond us that he seems almost totally foreign to us. To be holy is to be other to be different in a special way. David's initial response to Uzzah's death was born out of over-familiarity -familiar with God. Verse 8 says, And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. He broke out. Where do you remember hearing that word before? Last week's sermon. He broke out against the Philistines in a, in a flood that, that destroyed the Philistines. 
It was used in the previous passage in chapter 5 when he broke out through uh, uh, the, 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 the Jebusites in Jerusalem in the stronghold. But here the Lord breaks out against one person in Israel. God's anger, we read in verse 7, was kindled against Uzzah for touching the ark. And David's anger was kindled against God in response. But whose anger was righteous? Now David and we, we must acknowledge, we are certainly capable of righteous anger. But we also have to recognize that not all human anger is righteous. Probably the vast majority of human anger is not righteous. But God's anger is always righteous because he is always holy. He is perfectly just in all of his ways. He is without sin. He cannot sin. And so David's angry response to God's righteous anger was sinful and indicative of the fact that he was not holding the Lord with proper respect. Now, when our family was on vacation this summer, we visited the Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. It's, it's one of those parts that's so far out of the way, it wasn't heavily uh, visited, not heavily traveled. And when we arrived to the park in the evening on the first day we were there, we went to the south unit. We read that that was a really good time to go. You could see the wildlife moving about more because it was cooler that time of day. And as we drove along the road in the park, we came upon a herd of bison off to the left side of the road. And there were numerous cars stopped on both sides of the road watching this magnificent herd of bison, maybe as many as 100, including 15 to 20 calves. And one thing about bison, they go pretty much where they want to go. And so some of them started roaming, coming onto the road, walking between the cars. And so we got to see them up close. But we were not about to get out of the car and pet these, these animals, these creatures. They were massive. It had been several years since I'd seen a bison up close, and I'd forgotten just how huge they are, but I'd never been in the midst of a herd before. And that is where their real power is on display. You do not want to upset a herd of bison and start a stampede. They will trample everything in their path. And we did not have to teach our children to have a proper respect for the bison in this herd. They just knew intuitively that the bison were not to be messed with. Now, I want to acknowledge very quickly that God is not a beast. He's not an animal. He's not a creature. He is the creator of all creatures. And yet I do think it's proper to make an argument from the lesser, that is, at least bison, to the greater, God. If we have an almost innate respect and awe for a creature, powerful though he may be, how much more ought we to have respect and awe and even reverence for the creator of all things? And if we know this, even as children at an, at an intuitive level about a beast, how much more ought we to know it about God himself, who is no beast, but who is almighty God? Now, David quickly moved beyond his unrighteous anger in verse 8 toward God. And so in verse 9, we read there that David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he asked, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And this again shows the tenderness of David's heart. He was angry. He spoke out against the Lord. But then the Lord corrected him. And I believe here is a picture of repentance for David. It's not clearly listed out, steps of repentance, the things that he did, and yet we can see that there is a change of heart, a change of mind that takes place in David. And as 1 Chronicles 15 makes clear, David set out to follow all of the requirements for trans the ark after this incident. He gathered together the sons of Aaron, those who were responsible for wrapping the holy things uh, that were in the Holy of Holies. He gathered together the Kohathites, who were responsible for bearing the ark and the other holy things, and they transported the ark the proper way as prescribed by the Lord. But that has more to do with next week's passage. In our passage this morning, in verses 10 and 11, we read that David wasn't willing to take the ark into Jerusalem. He was afraid. He had seen the power of the Lord on display. And so he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. 
who must have lived close by the site of the incident. And the ark remained there in the house of Obed-Edom for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his household. Brothers and sisters, God is not domesticated. He is not tame. He is not the kind of God of whom you can make an image and put it up on your mantle. But he is good, and he is kind, and he is merciful, and he is our Heavenly Father. Now you and I, we have not come to what may be touched, as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 puts it. But as verses 22 to 24 of that same passage, passage say, You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. The ark was the symbol of God's presence. But Jesus is God himself in the flesh. Jesus, the one upon whose breast the beloved disciple lay his head, the one who invited Thomas to touch with his own hand, but also the one who said, Woe to you, Jerusalem, the one who cleansed the temple. Jesus welcomes us to come to him. He invites us to unburden our souls. And he took the great burden of our sin upon himself on the cross. And yet he is still very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father. Jesus came to us not to make God into our buddy, but so that we might have God as our Father. He came to us not to simply make excuses for our sins, to, but, but to make us uh, make atonement for our sins and to make us holy like him. He came to, to make us set apart from the rest of the world, to be pure in heart. And as Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We ought to be grateful and to offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. He will purify with fire his people. He will refine us. And he will punish those with fire who hate him. But until that great day of judgment, he is still seeking out those who will become worshipers, those who will set aside their idols, those who will not treat him like a created thing, but like the creator who he is. He is seeking those who will worship him and in spirit and in truth. And brothers and sisters, that is good news. That is how you have come to know him, to trust him, to love him. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and most holy God, we are thankful that though we have in and of ourselves no business knowing you, much less being in a relationship with you, you have made us to know you. You have made yourself known to us. And you've given us new eyes to see, new ears to hear. You have replaced our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. You've caused us to be born again unto a new and living hope. And so, dear Lord, we are thankful for the privilege of being able to worship you. We thank you that you have given us instruction as to how you are to be worshipped. We're thankful, dear Lord, that you have shown us who you are. Perhaps not truly, not, not fully, not comprehensively, but most certainly truly. And we know, dear Lord, that you are indeed a consuming fire. And we know that we are to worship you with reverence and with awe. And yet, O oh Lord, we are grateful that you are our Father, that you have adopted us as your sons and daughters. We are thankful that we can cry out to you with every need, with every concern, with every fear, with every doubt. We're thankful, O oh Lord, that you have called us to yourself. We pray, O oh Lord, that like David, you would cause us to be quick to repent 
We pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to see our errors and to desire quickly to correct them. But we thank you, O oh Lord, that you have caused us to know you and to love you. And we are thankful that we can walk with you all of our days. We pray, dear Lord, that you would please guide us as we walk with you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if you will, please pull out the, the handout that's in your, or the bulletin insert that's in your bulletins.